The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to AFTD's educational webinar series. Today's webinar is the, AFT, the FTD Disorders Registry and How It Can Advance Research, presented by Dr. Diana Wheaton. I'm Sharon Denny, Program Director at AFTD, and on behalf of all of us here and Dr. Wheaton, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items to help you participate in today's event. Dr. Wheaton will present her information in two parts. Following each part of the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for questions. We ask that you submit your questions by typing them into the questions section, which is located towards the bottom of your control panel. Please send your questions as you think of them. We will ask as many as possible at the end of each section. We will have you muted for the duration of the presentation. You can hear us, but we can't hear you. And this helps to keep background, down, background noise down to a minimum so that everyone can hear the presentation clearly. If you have any technical issues, please write a message in the questions box and Bridget Moran McCabe or I will try to address the issue. Today's webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes. We're recording this and we'll post it on AFTD's YouTube channel and website soon so that anyone can access it. For those of you who are meeting us for the first time, AFTD is a national nonprofit organization whose entire focus is on FTD disorders. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for people affected by FTD and drive research for a cure. We do this every day through advancing research, awareness, support, education, and advocacy. AFTD offers an ever-growing array of help and support for people diagnosed with FTD, their families and friends, and the professionals that serve them. This includes accurate information via the AFTD website, a companion website for children and teens, and the only helpline in the country devoted to FTD. Each helpline call and email is answered individually by a specially trained AFTD staff member. AFTD's national network of support groups provides facilitators with ongoing education, support, and networking with peers to best meet the needs of FTD families in their community. New facilitators are always welcome. The Comstock grant program provides direct assistance for people to travel to an FTD conference or to access respite to recharge. A new pilot program helps persons diagnosed with FTD access goods or services that will enhance their quality of life. And finally, Partners in FTD Care is an education initiative for health professionals and family caregivers alike with, care, with case examples and strategies for managing care. If you're interested in any of these opportunities, please let us know through the helpline and staff will get back to you to discuss them further. Next up from AFTD are some dates and opportunities for your calendar. AFTD's annual Food for Thought campaign is right around the corner. For two weeks at the end of September and the start of October, we will celebrate FTD awareness with fun events in all 50 states. A new toolkit makes it easier than ever to share some food and your FTD story to raise awareness and funds to support our mission. For more information, please contact our grassroots coordinator, Bridget Graham. The next installment of this educational webinar series will be in November, and we will be sending more information about the next um, webinars shortly. And AFTD's annual education conference will be Friday, April 13th in Chicago. We hope that you can plan to join us now for this unique education and networking opportunity. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Dr. Diana Wheaton. Dr. Wheaton joined the field of FTD research as the director of the FTD Disorders Registry in January of 2016. She has an MS degree in biology and her PhD in health studies with a focus in community and population health from the Texas Women's University. Diana served as the first director of the Southwest Eye Registry, guiding it from its early days to a registry which has supported a number of clinical trials. She has more than 20 years of clinical science research experience in genetic counseling for patients and at-risk family members. As registry director, Diana manages the daily operations of the FTD Disorders Registry, working directly with persons diagnosed with FTD and their families and leading outreach efforts to, lay, to the lay and health professional communities. She assists clinicians and other researchers and organizations interested in using the registry to answer important research questions and to support clinical trials. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Diana Wheaton to us, to our program today. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to uh, 
have the invitation to speak with you and talk a little bit more about the registry. And uh, actually what I want to do is give you some background as well as tell you a little bit about our enrollment progress and describe uh, kind of what some of our data outcomes that we've collected are so far. So first, let's start with a little bit of background information. And one of the first things that comes up in discussion with people is what actually is a patient registry. And according to NIH, or the National Institute of Health, a registry is a collection of information about individuals that's usually focused around a specific diagnosis or condition. Now, registries come in kind of different shapes and sizes, and we can, in a general sense, categorize them as contact registries or research registries. A contact registry is one of the more basic forms of registry, and it is usually composed of both contact information and some basic demographics, but it should not be construed to be an email list. Uh, even at its most basic, a contact registry needs to collect uh, information sufficient to evaluate inclusion or exclusion criteria for research studies. Research registries, by comparison, are much more complex, and they also come in a number of varieties. Uh, they can be clinical-centric uh, in the sense that uh, their medical records-derived data, which is usually entered by a member of the study team. So somebody that actually works at that clinical site is responsible for doing the data entry. And the data itself is what we call quantitative data. And you can ask yourself what quantitative data. It is actually information that is a definitive measure. So like height and weight, how much of something, laboratory uh, test results, those are all quantitative data. And in a clinical-centric registry, the clinician or researcher are actually the experts. They're the ones who decide what information is collected, uh, what, what the important elements are to collect and analyze. This type of a registry is uh, often used for natural history data collection. And natural history is literally monitoring a disease over a period of time and capturing the changes in symptoms so that we know what the natural progression of a disease is. And that's important because if we're going to propose to do clinical studies or to intervene in the disease, we need to know what the natural course of the disease is so that we have a yardstick to measure against. Clinical-centric registries are also quite often used then for hypothesis testing. They are the type of registry that we use uh, to test interventions very often because of the type of data that is, is collected there. In contrast, a patient-centric research registry is very often data entered by the participant. And this type of data is very often qualitative. And qualitative data really means descriptive data. It's more how and why and describing something than it is actually measuring with a yardstick. Uh, it's very rich data, which is quite informative when it comes to assessing impact of a disease on a person or their family. And in this sense, the patient-centric registry the patients themselves or their family members and caregivers are the experts. 
we can also use a patient-centric registry for natural history. And it just is a different type of data analysis. This information is important for hypothesis generation. So it, it helps us look and gain new ideas for new questions we should ask and can use that then to measure in a follow-up study. Perhaps even more importantly is the fact that a registry is, in its own sense, a community. A patient registry fosters a sense of community and belongingness. It offers the opportunity to develop new relationships and it gives participants a voice. And this is very important when it's a rare disease, uh, when you may be the only person at your clinical site or doctor's office who has this diagnosis. A registry, participation in a registry can actually remove that sense of isolation and can provide a sense of identity and validation. Joining a registry in and of, of itself is an act of advocacy. So a registry creates hope and it provides an opportunity for self-determination, proactiveness that is really lacking, especially in rare diseases with limited or no treatment. So the STD Disorders Registry began as an idea, an idea that was nurtured and cultivated. It was designed, the registry was actually designed to be a secure online database for all individuals who wished to participate in STD research. A true community where you can share your experience of STD and help us understand these diseases better and support the development of new treatments. Registries are very important in diseases which are rare, and STD disorders are rare diseases. It helps us to organize uh, the community and to pool the data so that we can actually assess a larger body of data than is available to us in an individual clinical setting. This is truly critical because with rare diseases, no single clinical site will have a large enough population to fill a research study or clinical trial enrollment. So the FTD Disorders Registry was created as a fully independent entity with the patient caregiver registry as the sole nonprofit mission. It was founded in March 2015 by AFTD and Bluefield Project for the Cure, and it is funded by grants from AFTD, Bluefield Project, and the Rainwater Charitable Foundation Tau Consortium. Oversight for the registry is provided by a management committee as well as a scientific advisory board. And our scientific advisory board is composed of noted clinicians and specialists drawn throughout the neurology and FTD field. Our overriding mission is to facilitate and advance research into the spectrum of FTD disorders with the goal to create and curate a patient caregiver registry to serve as a resource to the entire FTD disorders community. This includes persons diagnosed as well as their families, caregivers, clinical care providers, and researchers in biotech pharma, it, it really is to be a resource to the entire FTD community. 
our aims are to maintain our secure online database and to cultivate the registry as a community. And furthermore, to collaborate and partner with clinicians, researchers, biotech pharma, patient advocacy groups, and allied organizations so that together we can drive research and advance the science and truly establish the registry as the go-to source to support research studies and clinical trial recruitment. The FTD Disorders Registry format is actually both a contact and research registry. It is a hybrid of the two. As a contact registry, we are allowed to enroll persons internationally. As a research registry, we do have geographic boundaries, and our current research registration includes the United States and Canada. The research registry will focus on health outcome research, and this means such things as natural history studies, assessing prevalence, comorbidities, disease impact, and clinical trial research readiness. So your perception of uh, clinical trial and research studies. We also will greatly focus on supporting clinical trial and research study recruitment. The format of the data entry is self-report participant entered data through the use of online surveys. And the data we collect will be curated and audited so that we can error check it for omission. Our research protocol is IRB approved. And IRB stands for Institutional Review Board. It means we have regulatory oversight for our research activities which serves to help protect uh, your, your participation as a research subject. We, are also, uh, we also have created the registry and the IT backbone as a HIPAA-compliant platform. So with this in mind, we are very concerned about uh, data privacy and confidentiality. Okay, this, this is the first slide where we will now take a look at the uh, registry homepage for the website. And hopefully some of you have had the opportunity to perhaps join the registry already or at least taken a tour of some of our web pages. Uh, but the first question as somebody that's potentially interested in the registry Maybe why join? Uh, is there a benefit to you? Is there a benefit to science? Is there a benefit to others? And the answer to that is yes. Your unique experience can improve our knowledge of STD. It can impact the standard of care and it can help others. By agreeing to participate in our research surveys, you, the participant, will be providing data to help advance the science. You are the expert. The registry will become the go-to site to recruit for FTD trials. This will be the location that clinical study researchers and biotech pharmacists will approach to try to recruit patients. Now let's take a closer look at some key sections from the homepage. And first and foremost, the message that we would like for you to take to heart is the fact that in the world of STD, every story advances the science. 
starting with yours. And working together, we can make a difference. The next question when considering joining the registry may be, who can join? And the answer to that is persons diagnosed with any of the FTD disorders, current or former spouse, family members, caregivers, or friends of a person diagnosed with FTD. And we'll look a little closer now at those individual categories. As a person diagnosed with FTD, you can self-enroll if you're able to do so, or you can enroll with the help of a care partner to help co-manage your accounts. If you are a biological family member, you can join the registry and give your perspective about FTD. Or as a spouse, caregiver, friend, you can enroll in the registry. Now, in selecting your enrollment category, you, you are also designating uh, your research, your selection as a potential research participant later. So this step of selecting your category of enrollment is somewhat important. Uh, if you ultimately plan to be a research participant, if you self, if you designate as the spouse caregiver friend enrollment, that means that your subsequent research enrollment is for yourself. If, by contrast, you select as a person diagnosed with FTD, either uh, enrolling alone or with help, that means your subsequent enrollment in research, if you elect to do so, the FTD diagnosed person will become the research participant. So selecting your correct category for the initial enrollment is very important. That category equals the participant, the research participant in, in later enrollment if you choose to do so. By selecting one of those three categories of enrollment, it takes you to a join page. And joining the contact registry means sharing your name and email address. And so you will see the registrant information section uh, displayed on the page here, which merely asks for first name, last name, zip code, and your year of birth. Uh, the registrant selection, if you Pick your category coming from the home page will be pre selected and filled for you, but you can alter that choice if you if you should choose to do so. If you have selected to enroll as a person diagnosed enrolling for yourself or with health, your registration page has a second part on the bottom of it that allows you to enter care partner information. And I'm going to actually pop that section up a little bit bigger so we can look at it. And you may elect to fill out that care partner information upon enrollment, or you can select the small checkbox uh, just above those data entry fields that say that I will choose to do this later. At the very bottom of that page, on everybody's enrollment page, there's a small checkbox about uh, receiving uh, informational updates through email or newsletters. And we hope that everybody chooses to check that box to receive communications from the registry. And by clicking the yellow button at the bottom of that page, you will have completed the process for joining the contact registry. And you will arrive at a thank you page. 
the thank you page explains the next step of participation, which is research uh, registration. This is optional. Uh, we encourage everybody to participate if they're eligible to do so. But it means to create a login account with passwords and to also sign an informed consent. The key eligibility criteria includes, which are shown in the lower portion of that page, includes being a person diagnosed, uh, a biological family member or a spouse, caregiver, friend of a person diagnosed with FTD, being 18 years of age, as well as a resident of the US or Canada. Now I'm going to click uh, on the page and enlarge the center section, which gives some additional information about participating in research. So persons diagnosed with FTD, as we talked about earlier, can join independently or with the help of a care partner to co-manage their account. If they choose to participate in research, they need to be able to answer questions independently or with assistance. If they're unable to do so, then for research participation purposes, we suggest that a caregiver, family member, or friend join for research participation so that they can actually represent the voice of the FTD diagnosed person. However, that FTD diagnosed person can still join the contact registry uh, even if they can't participate in research and fill out the subsequent survey. I also want to point out that current or former caregivers, family members and friends can join the registry even if their uh, FTD diagnosed loved one is not a registry participant or has already passed away. Your voice is very important to us and we, we encourage you to enroll. If you do elect to uh, click the yellow button at the bottom of that page that says I'm eligible and I want to participate, you'll be taken to step one of registering for research participation. And this step is actually creating your login account with password. It's as simple as creating your username, which can be either your email address or another unique name that you choose. If there happen to be more than one person in the household that's wanting to join the registry, I need to remind you that your username must be unique from each other. So if you do choose to use a shared email account, you both cannot elect to have your email account as your username. The next step before completing this page is to create your password and confirm it, and then click the yellow button, and you will have created your password protected account. Step two of registration is the informed consent, and it is given uh, to you as administered in two parts, where part one is understanding your participation. And granted, the illustration on, the, on your screen uh, is much too small to read uh, and isn't intended for you to try to read all that as part of uh, today's overview. But I uh, will tell you that this particular part of the consent process explains to you what it is to participate in research, what your rights as a research participant are, that you can discontinue research at any time, and describes the process to be able to do that. And it details what registry research actually is, which is participating in online surveys. 
part two of that consent document, which I just switched uh, your image to, actually has a series of questions that you need to answer to indicate that you understood the information provided and that you understand the concept of participating in research. So you will need to answer uh, those questions and provide your signature in a little signature box at the bottom of that page and submit your consent form. And then that takes you to step three, which is uh, to provide specific information, personal information for the research participant so that the global unique identifier can be assigned. And a global unique identifier is uh, a special coded number, alphanumeric number, that is assigned to protect your privacy and confidentiality. So we use your very unique personal information to generate that code. And that way, any subsequent data collection that is done only has that global unique identifier embedded in the document and not not your name or any other personally identifiable information. Uh, the research participant information provided on this form actually is related back to the original enrollment selection category. So that person or category that you identified at with at the very beginning is the research participant. So if you joined as an FTD diagnosed person, the information that goes on this form, the research participant, that belongs to, the personal information belongs to that particular individual. If you joined as a spouse, caregiver, friend, the research participant is the spouse, caregiver, friend, not your FTD diagnosed loved one. So once you have completed, uh, that was the last step, uh, once you've completed your research registration, you will get a thank you email from the registry and you will be in a period of a two to three day wait for your global unique identifier to be assigned. Once that, that grid, has been assigned, you will receive another email that says you can return to your dashboard and that you have a survey available to you to begin filling out. And so the next question then that comes up is how do I return and get to my dashboard? And on the home page in the upper right hand corner is a participant. Uh, login link and it's found on uh, nearly all of the registry web pages and I just put a little highlighter circle around where you can locate that participant login link and if you click on that link it will take you to the displayed welcome back page that is shown on this slide. So if you did in fact create your password protected account, you would merely enter your username and password and click log in to re-enter the website and arrive at your personal dashboard. Now this page is also important uh, because it provides you a way to check your research registration. Uh, and I highlighted a link uh, for you to find that. It says check to see if you're already registered. If you happen to be a person who joined the contact registry and did not at that time decide to uh, complete your research registration, you can click on this link and it will send you, you'll enter some information and you'll enter your first name, your last name, 
and your email account. And the system will send you an email that has a clickable link so that you can return to your registration process where you left off. Now this page is also important because it provides a place for you to uh, clickable link for you to uh, get information about your username or password. So if you happen to forget that information, you can click this link. You will be asked to enter some information, and again, you'll receive a uh, a personal email with a clickable link on how to reset your information. Now, it's also important at this point for me to, again, describing the login and research participation, that the registry would highly recommend that you use a personal computer for your research participation rather than a smartphone or a small tablet. And one of those reasons, and a good compelling reason for that is that the surveys are actually optimally created for display on a computer monitor and not a small device. And it can be somewhat frustrating if some of your instructions uh, are not fully displayed on the screen uh, and you're having to scroll up and down uh, quite frequently on small devices. Uh, so it is uh, a much better experience uh, for the participant if you are using a personal computer. Another issue is that on some of the small devices, particularly smartphone or a tablet that's seven inches or smaller, that little participant login button that I pointed out uh, for this page doesn't display on all devices. And so unless you have bookmarked the page, the welcome back page, you will have problems accessing your login site on one of those small devices. So we do truly endorse that you choose to use a personal computer for completing the surveys. This is actually, once you get signed all the way back in, this is an image from a participant dashboard. And you'll see that there are tabs for surveys, my account, and notifications. Uh, so you would uh, click on any of those tabs and uh, be taken specifically to a page for surveys where you would find any, any surveys that have been loaded to your dashboard. The My Account page allows you to make changes to your account information, and notifications actually displays emails that have been sent to you from the registry. Uh, the data collection tools we already indicated uh, are the of the format of surveys and questionnaires. And the registry has three intake surveys that are demographic, disease impact, and research readiness. These are very important for research participants to fill out as the information generated in these surveys actually completes your research profile. And we use that information to determine potential elements eligibility for participation in future studies. We also have been allowed the privilege to administer the Artful Clinical Network Surveys, which uh, they actually use at their own clinical sites as part of their research. And these are the Lifestyle Questionnaire, Autoimmune History, and Clinical Trials Survey. And we will be adding additional surveys to the registry as time goes on. Data privacy and confidentiality is one of our most utmost concerns, and the registry has taken numerous steps to protect not only data integrity, but more importantly, your privacy. And 
obviously one of those measures is to de-identify your data. And we do that by assigning the global unique identifier and also restricting who has access to that personal information. And the registry director and registry manager are the uh, sole persons who have access to that personal information. Uh, in any other uh, data, any other aspect of the database, the information is completely decoupled and de-identified, such that aggregate de-identified data is what is shared with the public through the website, through newsletters, through publications. Any third-party access, such as uh, a request from a clinician or a researcher, their access is only to a subset of de-identified data. And these requests are reviewed by our scientific advisory board and approved by the management committee. And uh, at this point, we'll take a little break and uh, ask if we have questions about enrollment uh, or any, any other questions that, that you may uh, have brought to mind up to this point. Thank you, Diana. Diana, that's a great presentation and a great point to pause for questions. We do have folks who've been typing and sending a, a variety of questions in. So I'm just going to ask them kind of in order, um, and we'll go through as many as we can before you're ready to move on. So um, if people participate in the registry, does their entry, the registry, restrict in any way the types of research that they would participate in? Okay, so to if, if they elect to participate in the registry, does it in some way restrict or compromise their ability to participate in another research study? Am, am I articulating? I believe so. So I think the question is, yes, if you're participant in the, re in the registry, does that in any way limit your opportunity to take part in studies you might find elsewhere? And it should not. Now, there are, for other clinical trials or clinical interventions or research studies, very often there is a limiting criteria that you can only do one study at a time. The registry is is not an interventional study. Uh, so it does not interfere with your ability to participate in other studies. And in fact, I would say the participation in the registry, as you have said, is actually a conduit to being able to hear about clinical trials or clinical studies that you might be eligible for. But enrollment in the registry itself does not in any way limit people. That is exactly right. Great, thank you. Okay, um, and uh, you've talked about privacy of the registry. How secure is the registry? You know, people hear in the popular press a lot about data breaches. Um, can you just speak to the security of the data? And we've, we've been very careful with how we have constructed the architecture of uh, the database and the access, and it is, it is very secure. Uh, it, we have limitations as to who has the ability to uh, sign into the registry, and there's different levels of uh, uh, privileges that are assigned to that. Uh, our, our database lives in a, it actually lives in a couple different secure clouds, so we have partitioned our data so that all of the data doesn't live in one place. Uh, which is in itself uh, a protection. Uh, but each, each of the storage areas where information is held are high-level secure areas which are HIPAA compliant. And all of our data transmission that takes place between our different components are uh, integrated in such a fashion that it protects the data. Uh, so we uh, we really believe we have taken a great deal of care to, to protect the data. Uh, there is no local uh, copy 
of the registry sitting on a uh, backup device or a computer. It is all in these secure uh, cloud locations. Thank you. You had mentioned that people can still participate in the registry if their loved one diagnosed with FTD has passed away. Um, there's a couple of other questions about some of the logistics of the progressive nature of the disease. So if somebody has registered and then becomes unable to maintain their account or passes away, what happens to the account? How is that handled? Okay, that's a very good question. So what, uh, when somebody becomes unable to continue with their account, we actually uh, close their account to further data collection. The account doesn't necessarily disappear or go away because we've already collected important data for that person, but that account is frozen, so to speak, at that, that point in time from any further data collection. Uh, so that's and we have different communications with registrants over a uh, time basis to try to make sure that accounts are active and in use. And if we suspect that uh, an account has gone dormant, uh, we will uh, we will freeze that account from further participation. But if somebody is proactive and is aware that their loved one can no longer participate, they can also email the registry and ask for the account to be frozen from that point forward. And the account for the caregiver continues to be active. And the account for the caregiver can continue to be active beyond that. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, there's a, a question about the registry being open to folks right now only in the U.S. and Canada. Can you speak to any plans for it being extended beyond that? Yes, we do. Uh, we do have plans to expand uh, international enrollment, uh, and that's one of the actual one of the points of uh, allowing the contact registry to include international enrollment. Is it allows us to assess where uh, where interested parties are, so that we can prioritize uh, which countries to to try to interact with first to bring into our registration, research registration. Uh, but it, it will be on a country by country basis because of differences in research participation regulations. And so it becomes a, an institutional review board issue. Uh, it definitely isn't a matter of our willingness uh, to extend the registry to international participants is, is a regulatory issue. So people can sign up now for the contact registry, and then, as you say, as country by country, as it, the research piece would be opened, those folks in the contact registry could be contacted <laughs> to know for sure that it right. becomes available. Exactly. Uh, so there's a couple questions, I think, about how people register the patient and the caregiver. Um, so can you start actually maybe Diana by clarifying how does somebody know if the person with FTD is able to participate in the research registry or not? Okay. So when research uh, research participation uh, is really the ability to uh, complete the surveys. And so if the individual has the capability to complete the survey with assistance, meaning you can ask them questions and they can indicate their choice, even if someone has to do the computer part on their behalf, they're capable of research participation. If they are able to communicate their selection, their answer response, uh, they're able to participate in the research. If they, if they are unable to interact in that capacity, then they can join the contact registry 
and their STD diagnosed caregiver, their, the caregiver or spouse can actually register in that category as spouse caregiver and have a research account. And they will be giving responses from their perspective as a spouse caregiver, but also have the opportunity to give voice or act as an informant for the FTD diagnosed person. And in the event that the person diagnosed is not able to fill out the surveys and therefore be a participant outright in the registry, in the research portion of the registry, does that mean that they are not eligible to participate in clinical trials? No, it does not. It does not restrict them from participating in clinical trials. So even the caregiver, um, spouse caregiver, um, as informant, will be telling us about the FTD diagnosed person. And based on the information that they're providing, we know that there is a potential FTD diagnosed person available to participate in a research study. So the notice would go about an upcoming study would go to the spouse caregiver uh, who would then potentially be able to uh, follow up on behalf of their loved one to participate in that in that study. And I know, you know, from all the contacts that we have with folks calling the helpline at AFTD, that there's a tremendous desire in our community to be able to participate in studies as they come online. And I just want to really underscore that the whole purpose of the registry is to try to maximize participation for those people who are interested and who are eligible. And so trying to cast the widest net for eligibility in studies is really part of the goal here, because we know that it's really asking a lot of people and we know that it's challenging to participate. So by, um, as you had said earlier, I think this is an advocacy tool. You know, people can advocate and be heard in kind of this whole part of our business in ways that was not available before. Um, so it's really exciting in that way. There's a couple other questions and then I'm, I'm gonna ask you to move on to your um, okay. next portion. Uh, one is, are there brochures of any kind or any kind of literature that people can take to their doctors to display in the rating, waiting room or to give to patients? Yes, the registry does have brochures and they do, we do have a handout that's uh, a fact, what we call a fact sheet. Uh, and we will be, providing copies of those to quite a number of different clinical sites, uh, we will look into, and, and of course, some of our key patient advocacy groups will have copies available as people perhaps request from them as well. But you can also contact the registry if, if you want your doctor's office, if you want to inform us of the doctor's office that you think would be a likely place to put some of our brochures or handouts, uh, you can provide that information to us and we'll be happy to, to do that. Great, and the last question in this section is, you know, we, we all know that FTD is a clinical diagnosis. Is there a, a mechanism for follow-up within the registry to record autopsy results if the family obtains them? That is an excellent question and we do not currently have a mechanism to accept that information. It is one of the things on our list that we are checking into as far as what, you know, what capability we would need to add to maintain and protect that information. But at this point, the answer is no, we don't have a, a repository to handle that type of data. Excellent. Well, thank you. And we're going to ask you to move ahead to the next section of your presentation. Okay. Okay. So now it's time to shift focus a little bit. We've talked all about background and registration, and now it's time to talk about the actual launch of the registry. And what I have displayed here is actually an image from our Facebook page from March. Uh, when we were uh, giving a quick pre-announcement that our grand launch was going to happen the next, that very next week. 
So up to, leading up to that launch was uh, a lot of quality assurance testing as well as a phased rollout. So to say that it was test, test, and retest, and test some more, uh, we did a lot of, of testing with a number of different types of uh, user groups uh, to try to make sure that functionality for the registry was what we thought it should be for our community. And then once we thought we had uh, had the keep uh, work out, we went through a process that we call the phase rollout or a soft launch. And this meant that we sent email invitations to some specific individuals that we uh, had already been in contact with and invited them to join the registry. And this occurred during December of 2016, as well as again in February of 2017. And it's possible that some of you listening in today may actually have participated in one of those special soft launch activities. If so, we thank you very much. You helped uh, a great deal uh, in us knowing that the registry was in fact ready to launch uh, to the public. And so the grand launch was planned and executed on March 26th of uh, this year. And we set an enrollment goal of 100 new registrations within the first two weeks. And we designated that the period of March 26th through uh, the 19th of April was actually our grand launch period. And we enrolled during that period of time a total of 380 individuals across those three different categories of persons diagnosed, biological family members, and spouse, caregiver, friends. So we did, in fact, exceed our enrollment goal within the first 24 hours. We exceeded 200 newly enrolled persons within two weeks. So where are we at now? The registry enrollment as of August 23rd yesterday was 914 individuals. And this pie chart displays those individuals by geographic distribution. So 742 individuals are from the U.S. and 172 have joined from an international location. And now we can take a closer look at the U.S. registrants and see that basically we're getting individuals registering from all across the United States. And if we then dig a little deeper and look at those registrants by their category of enrollment, we find out that 120 individuals are FTD diagnosed enrolling independently or with help. Biological family members constitute 338 individuals and spouse caregiver friends constitute 452. If we look by participation type, you will see essentially a 50-50 split between contact registry versus research registry. And that little slice of pie that's in between is actually uh, accounts that have not yet finished the validation process. So they can't be put in uh, the bin either for contact or research registry yet. So over the next 12 to 18 months, the goals for the registry can be summarized under two major headings, and those are to actively grow and cultivate our community of participants, to really build enrollment, and to raise awareness. But it's far more than just growing our numbers. It truly is 
cultivating and engaging our participants. So the registry will be launching our newsletters and our email updates. We will also uh, launch our stories on the website, which is uh, a special feature in which you can write a story from your perspective for us to share on the website about how FTD has impacted you or your family. That second uh, major aim over the next 12 to 18 months is to conduct outreach to promote partnership and collaboration within the FTD clinical and research community and really to promote uh, what our mission and goals and objectives are and to identify potentially allied patient advocacy groups, clinical networks, research organizations, uh, and industry, and basically cultivate opportunities for partnering and collaboration. And now I'm showing you a really a very busy slide uh, to illustrate the registry collaboration throughout the entire FTD community. And I'm not going to take the time to explain everything that's represented here. Uh, the take home message from this slide is that the patients, caregivers, and family members are central to our efforts. And you'll see that there's, uh, they're displayed at the very top of this schematic, and you'll see lots of arrows. Uh, pointing to and going away from them, that they are central to the registry function and what we hope to accomplish to collaborate to advance research. So now that we have registrants uh, who have joined the registry, they've started completing their intake surveys so we have data flowing into the registry. What can we do with that data? Obviously, at a very simple level, we can tabulate who, where, how many, but we really want to go beyond these basic demographic characteristics and build a clearer picture of the impact of FTD from a patient, caregiver, and family perspective, such that it may help us, what you tell us, may help us to ask better questions. It may drive new hypotheses. What you tell us may help us assess research study and clinical trial feasibility, hopefully to create more patient-centric design and outcome measures, as well as facilitate recruitment and study retention. We also hope to use the data to raise awareness and advance research and facilitate advocacy throughout the FTD community. So we hope to partner and collaborate to make the registry a key resource for all and to share and publish data. And I wanna give you a quick look at uh, some output from the demographic survey. These are just basic statistics and you'll see that it's grouped in two different uh, two different tables. This upper table being for FTE diagnosed persons specifically, and the lower table for spouse caregiver friends. And you can see that some of those basic statistics are uh, the enrollment category, uh, whether it's a spouse caregiver friend or a person diagnosed enrolling for their spouse or with a helper, gender. Uh, the diagnosis and racial ethnic group. So we are absolutely collecting all of that information. But perhaps more interestingly is the additional questions that are part of our intake survey. And just to give you a little taste, I'm going to show you three of those questions. And this is uh, the output from 122 participants. And the questions were posed regarding 
the person diagnosed with FTD. And that first question was, did the FTD diagnosed person have genetic testing for any of the FTD risk genes? And that's the pie chart to, to your left. And 17% of those respondents indicated that yes, they had had the FTD diagnosed person had genetic testing. 79% said no, and four did not know for certain whether they did or did not have genetic testing. The next question was a willingness to participate in research, and overwhelmingly, at 82%, FTD diagnosed persons indicated they were willing to participate in research. That final little pie chart at the bottom indicates whether the participants whether the person was a current participant in a research study. And 16% of respondents indicated that they were, in fact, a current participant in a research study. And 9% of those actually were participating in an artful study. So at this point, I want to uh, indicate to you that your participation truly has the power to make a difference. And we would like you to consider joining the FTD Disorders Registry to tell your story and help us advance the science. And then I'll allow us to, to then return and answer some more questions if, if there are any pressing uh, questions remaining. Excellent. Well, thank you. So, and I would invite people that if you have additional questions to please feel free to type them in and we'll um, get to as many as we can. Some of the questions I think people have, Diana, are, are pretty individual. Um, and so what we've been doing is suggesting that they reach out and contact you directly if they have particular questions about either their um, efforts to enroll or about how they might do that. Um, and so your email address, can I just ask you to speak that? And then knowing people can find it, of course, on the registry website, but maybe that's a good way to start as folks are compiling additional questions. And to ask questions regarding, to, regarding the, the registration enrollment, any, any registry-related question, you can direct that to uh, the director account email account, which is director at ftdregistry.org. So director at ftdregistry.org. There's no spaces, there's no underscore, uh, and it's not case sensitive. So director at ftdregistry.org. Great, thank you. Um, so in terms of some of the questions, um, is it possible for other people, so doctors, researchers, or you know, people from insurance companies, to sign in and access the database? And the answer to that is no. Uh, at this point, we do not have a researcher portal that allows for outside sign-in. Uh, any any question or any query regarding the database is. Uh, actually submitted to us as a request, is evaluated by the Scientific Advisory Board and then approved by the uh, Management Committee. And then I, as the director, execute a query of the database and provide a subset of de-identified data to, uh, to the person who requested the information, as long as it, as long as it met uh, the criteria uh, required by, you know, by our oversight. And are you, um, is the registry starting to get requests for that data and, and how close are you in terms of enrollment to be able to respond to some of those requests? And we are getting, uh, requests for information, uh, for, from researchers who are interested in uh, planning studies or clinical trials and wanting to know about uh, persons available 
uh, how many persons available at the particular type may be in the registry. Uh, and so we do, with, with the current numbers that we have in the registry, we're starting to be able to provide some of that information back um, in, in regard to those requests. And so one of the questions you actually have on your question slide is one that I think people are interested in, which is how will they know about studies that they may be eligible for? You had mentioned the dashboard. Are there other mechanisms that are used to communicate with people who are enrolled in the registry? So uh, there's a page, uh, one of the primary navigation pages on the registry website is the find a study page we will be listing uh, studies and clinical trials on that page. So that is one of the go-to places to find listings for clinical trials. We will also be putting information in newsletters as a new study may be announced. We will profile it in a newsletter. And if, uh, if we have been requested to actively recruit uh, on behalf of a particular study, there's also the potential that a registry participant would receive an email specifically to their email account, which announces a, a new study and provides contact information on how they would pursue obtaining additional information. Great, thank you. How big of a database is needed to make a difference in FTD research? That's, that's a very, very good question. Um, and when it, I guess what you can look at it perhaps by how, uh, how many numbers are needed for some of the clinical trials. And at this point, some of the clinical trials are looking to uh, enroll 30 to 50 participants of a specific subtype. So um, as clinical trials evolve, it's going to require bigger numbers than that. But you can see already if you have a trial that needs recruitment of about 30 individuals, that the registry already with our current enrollment has the potential to start making a difference. That's great. It's actually very exciting to see. Um, I'm going to ask you to go back for a minute to how people do select to sign up under what category. So I think there's an interest in hearing again some, can you clarify the difference between how would you know if you sign up as a biological relative or a caregiver? Like, Can you, um, within that one grouping, can you kind of parse the criteria for those different categories? Okay, and, and truly, it, it does become confusing because if somebody is a biological family member but also a caregiver, how which category do they pick? Um, and I guess the easiest way to decide that is if you are a biological family member, that's that's the category that you should, should select above and beyond the the caregiver role. You'll be able to define your relationship to uh, an STD di diagnosed person subsequently if, if you're participating in research. You'll be able to tell us more about your family history and if you've been a direct caregiver for somebody with, with STD. But it's more important for you to tell us if you are a biological family member uh, than Dating up front, your your caregiver role. Um, so the caregiver role is kind of designated for spouse caregivers who are unrelated biologically to the FTD diagnosed person. And I'm not sure if that fully answers where the question you were trying to pose to me, but I hope that covers part of the question. Right, I think so. And again, you know, I think if people know that they can just reach out to you, that don't be deterred from trying the registry because you have a question. Because right. um, 
uh, Diana as the director and a, the registry manager coming on would be very happy to, to help you with that. Um, there's also a question about people who may be in that portion of folks who are al already participating in a research study. If they are already participating in a research study, is there a way for the data, for that data to be part of, then be included somehow in the registry itself, in the FTD disorders registry? And that's, that's, that's a very good question because uh, when we designed the registry, we made a specific effort to, since we're using de-identified data with the registry, we sought out the other major research groups in FTD to see how, what method they were using to code their data. And the registry elected to use a global unique identifier system that is consistent with the, some of the major clinical studies that are, are already going on in the FTD community. So our unique coded identifier matches what they're using. So we can, in a de-identified manner, link data that's being collected at these clinical sites back to the data that we're collecting with the registry. And so Artful would be, the Artful studies would be an example of that where the the GUID and the de-identified data can be combined and people can also enter their information directly through the registry. Um, and it also matches then with other projects that an individual institution might be doing or are there other examples of how that potentially could work moving forward? And as, as other studies come online, we're, we're kind of promoting uh, that any large study kind of follows suit in their selection of their, um, how they're assigning their, uh, their coded identifier. And so that, that would expand the ability to connect uh, additional data gathered prospectively across other studies if those future studies use that same GUID uh, identification system. Great. Thank you. And you had one of your slides that had some of the early demographics showed the breakdown of FTD subtypes. Can you just speak for a minute to the um, diversity of those subtypes and whether a subtype needs to be known or um, if that information changes over time in terms of how people record that in the registry? Can you speak to that a little bit? And yes. Yeah. Absolutely, and I actually collapsed, uh, that was a simplification of some of our disease categories uh, because I collapsed the different subtypes of uh, primary progressive aphasia just to a single category of TPA. Um, so that is, that is a simplification uh, as far as what I illustrated, but you will be given in the surveys, you're given the uh, uh, option to um, select from the very specific diagnostic categories, uh, and some people don't know, uh, and so you pick you pick the closest one that you identify with, and some people have not finished their diagnostic process yet, and that's given as an option uh, that they they haven't yet received their diagnosis. And then, yes, over time, people's diagnosis do change, and we will address that as part of uh, the continued interaction with people as essentially asking if people have had a, a change in diagnosis and if we need to update that part of their registry information. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I think that's the last question. Um, and I thank you for your presentation and for your um, patience and, and really, um, really good, clear answers about many of these questions that people have. So um, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed visiting about the registry. Excellent. So, you know, on behalf of Dr. Wheaton and for all of us here, thank you very much for joining us. 
Um, she will be with us at the 2018 Education Conference in Chicago and would be very happy to meet folks and answer questions there uh, or even just to say hi because hopefully you will have all registered in the registry before April. Um, but she will be with us to, to represent the registry at that time. So thank you for joining us for this presentation. Um, as we said earlier, the webinar has been recorded and we will post it and send out the link as soon as it's available. Um, as always, please let us know if you have any comments or questions about the